Welcome everyone to Sum Zero. Today we have Chris Waller from Plural Investing. Um, Chris is a value investor, uh, Oxford grad, also part of the value investing program at Columbia Business School where he got his MBA um, and uh, is now running a fund and, and uh, is also a member of Sum Zero. So uh, Chris, great, great to have you with us today. Um, you're going to be pitching a couple stocks for us, um, but really quickly, just tell us about your background, how you got into value investing um, and a little bit about your fund strategy as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Divya, for having me um, on the podcast today. And uh, as you sort of touched on a bit on my background, I'm originally from the UK, but now based in uh, New York. And I run a fund called Plural Investing, where we target developed market small caps, um, where essentially limited coverage creates an opportunity for in-depth research to really get an edge. Um, I also thought just given the strong performance of US large cap indices, it might be worth giving listeners an idea of the types of opportunities we're seeing in this small cap value space, particularly internationally. Um, as I said, I'm originally from the UK. And if you look at the FTSE AIM uh, All Share Index, it's still down over 40% since its peak in 2021 and about 50% in US dollar terms. Um, and one of the stocks that we're going to talk about today is listed in Canada and, and the small cap exchange there is down about 50% as well in US dollar terms. So certainly a lot of um, value stocks that um, are bargains and, and areas where um, you know investors are largely ignoring that part of the market and where if you're willing to do that in-depth research, you can pick up these uh, hidden gems. So the strategy um, that I employ is all about trying to focus on just finding seven to eight uh, best ideas over a three to five year time horizon. And that means I can spend a lot of um, time on every opportunity. And I typically try and source and speak to roughly 20 industry professionals for each business um, to try and really get that in-depth understanding. Um, so that's sort of the background on, on the fund and, and why um, I approach it that way. And actually the two stocks, um, uh, we might talk about today have, have both been written up on some zero, and that actually includes the company with the largest market cap that um, I'm invested in, Kindrel, and also the smallest market cap, uh, CXI. So you'll get a sense of uh, the spectrum there. Uh, would you say that uh, is it a? It's a little bit of a blanket statement, but we've seen a recovery in larger cap names uh, now that interest rate expectations have come down. You, would you agree that we've not seen that recovery in the small cap universe as we have in the large cap space? We always hear about Mag Mag Seven now. Yeah, you know, big tech kind of taking this. Right? So, is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement, and that tends to take the headlines. Um, but if you look at some of these small cap indices, and I would say particularly internationally, actually last year a lot of those indices were sort of flat, even down in some cases. So there really hasn't been that recovery yet. Um, and, and value stocks, generally speaking, have then underperformed growth stocks, you know, even with uh, the change in interest rate environment. So I do think um, there are some opportunities to pick up a few bargains um, right now. Yeah, and I, I love your concentrated approach. I think that, you know, <laughs> it's always fun <laughs> to see conviction. So why don't we start with uh, CXI um, and, yeah. and then we can we can talk about some other names, too. Yeah, so... Um, CXI, and actually for full disclosure, just, just before I go into it, I should um, just mention that Plural Investing you know, currently holds a position in CXI as well as uh, Kindrel. So you know, everything we discuss should not be viewed as investment advice. And, and remember to always you know, do your own research. Um, you know, without, with, with that um, being out of the way, um, you know, Currency Exchange International, um, which has the ticker CXI in Canada, and CURN in the US has a market cap of about 110 million uh, US dollars. It carries net cash, um, trades for nine times PE, and is growing at a double digit rate. So, with growth and cash generation over the next three years, I think the stock actually trades on just five times earnings at that point. 
Um, the company is one of three major suppliers of foreign banknotes in the U.S., and also of U.S. dollars internationally. So, for example, if you uh, are traveling to Europe and you want to bring some euros with you, um, CXI would be one of three suppliers that would have supplied your local bank with that uh, those physical banknotes. Um, I think it's also important to mention that the company is run by its founder and CEO, Randolph Pienaar, who has been in this industry since 1987, I think, at the age of you know 18. He's run three businesses uh, in this industry, and I think is probably the best operator out there. He owns 24% of the stock today. Um, and I think an obvious question wow. is, who even uses banknotes anymore? Um, and, you know, isn't that sort of going uh, out of business and ultimately declining? And, you know, perhaps surprisingly, you know, revenues for this company grew 24% last year. And I think we'll grow double digits going forwards. And there's a, there's a few things going on. Although the use of cash is undoubtedly declining, actually spending on foreign banknotes has still been growing. Um, and that's because travel is a structurally growing trend. You've got GDP, uh, GDP growth, um, some inflation. So you've got a sort of high single digit tailwind um, to offset that mix shift from cash. Um, so, you know, at some point that that market, uh, you know, will probably decline um, eventually, but there are actually three company specific opportunities, which CXI has, which I think are, are quite important. And, you know, if helpful, I might just give, give a sort of brief overview of each of those uh, opportunities. Um, so the first is actually in the US before COVID, there were three other suppliers that would be... Um, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and TravelX. So uh, B of A and Wells are the two big ones with about 80% market share. Uh, TravelX and CXI, uh, not being banks and having significantly lower costs, are able to serve smaller customers. And what happened during COVID is TravelX effectively went out of business and um, has exited the US market. And so there's now a lot of white space for CXI to expand into. And to give you just an example of that, prior to COVID, CXI did not supply any airport locations. And today it supplies all but one airport agent in the US and is, is still expanding. So there were a lot of underlying gains that were masked by COVID that are now becoming increasingly apparent. Um, the second, and I think the most interesting opportunity is internationally where in late 2021, CXI became one of three suppliers in the world officially licensed by the Federal Reserve to export US dollars internationally. Um, that's really a huge market, I think probably $400 million plus, and is actually growing. And, and um, Bank of America really dominates the industry, but has been retrenching for some years. And actually, I think the Fed is guiding CXI's expansion because it's important for that continuous supply of US dollars around the world. And I think it's worth emphasizing how unique it is for a small company like this to have a powerful ally in the Federal Reserve in a pretty critical uh, market globally. Um, and so maybe just the last thing is the uh, use of cash. So I think one of the reasons the stock trades uh, is not valued more highly is that, um, you know, aside from being a small cap, um, investors wonder if the company will do something with its cash. Um, so if you look at the balance sheet, there's about 80 million in net cash on there. I think it's worth clarifying probably about 60 is needed in terms of physical banknotes. So that's really inventory rather than cash. There's maybe 20 million of net cash. Um, which is still growing and significant versus the market cap of 110 million. Um, and I think that whilst management have initiated a buyback, um, most cash will be used in M&A. So the CEO is sort of very value focused. I don't think he'll overpay, but there are some accretive deals that could be done. Um, you know, I've mentioned Bank of America potentially wanting to exit certain regions or certain parts of its business. And I could imagine CXI um, picking some of that up at a cheap multiple. Um, there would be a significant amount of synergies because you don't have to replicate the uh, you know, customer reps and compliance software technology and vaults. And so I think a deal would be highly accretive, could be funded with the existing banking facilities CXI has, 
and would really change the perception on the stock. So those are kind of, that's an overview and some opportunities as to why I think a banknotes business will continue growing significantly. You, you mentioned uh, your primary channel checks at the outset of the interview. I'm just curious what sort of channel check you've done on this particular stock. You can talk through those. Yeah, so I've spoken to um, former employees, you know, senior employees at all the uh, major companies in the industry. There aren't that many uh, in the industry. There's, as we touched on, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. There's a company called Money Corp internationally, um, as well as Travel TravelX. So I have spoken to people from all those industries, and I think it's uh, companies, and I think it's particularly interesting in this industry because there really isn't that much out there on the banknotes market. If you were to Google it, uh, there's really you know no research reports or anything out there. So to really kind of figure out what's happening in the market, you have to speak to people who are knowledgeable of the industry, um, which is which is why I think that's important. Got it. And you mentioned the trades at nine times earnings. Um, I'm assuming that's current earnings. Uh, what what yes. would you say is a fair multiple for the business? Well, that's a good question. You, you, you because mentioned it, the nine times, but what would you say? Yeah. So, I mean, actually, before COVID, no, go ahead. Um, you were saying, yeah, before COVID, it traded um, actually quite often over fifteen times. Um, and I think that uh, a business like this, mm. you know, we have to be realistic. There's always going to be a perception, given it's in the banknotes industry. Uh, we're probably talking a low double digit multiple, you know, somewhere between, let's say, 10 and 15 times uh, uh, earnings. Um, there aren't really any comps to uh, compare this to. Um, but, you know, given the earnings growth that the company is achieving and the cash generation, you know, because I think it's probably trading on five times earnings in three years, you know, that still gives a lot of upside. And I think the other thing I like about this company is just the downside risk. You know, given the cash on the balance sheet, the position in the market is not a market where lots of competitors are going to be, uh, you know, entering um, I'm quite comfortable with the downside uh, as well. Great. And what would you say is the biggest risk to your thesis? I think um, the, the two uh, final opportunities I talked about, you know, one being expanding internationally and the other being, uh, you know, executing uh, deals with their cash, both require um, good execution. And I think that's probably the biggest risk. So, Internationally, um, the company was approved in late 2021, and that's still a small business today. And I think there's been some investor frustration about the speed with which that business has been um, has been growing. And it's a little bit of a different market to the U.S. domestic uh, market because it involves you know talking to the Bank of Singapore and central banks around the world who need U.S. dollars, and those are relationships that typically have to be built over time and you know these these are large volumes of cash that are moving and i think building relationships and and trust is really important so um whilst i don't see any particular reason why they can't execute on that i do think it could take um, a significant amount of time and um there's been a few setbacks along the way but i think the company's uh, slowly building that business out and then on m a i think you know, there's always risk. They could overpay for something. They could um, they could buy something in perhaps the wrong industry. I think the company has a business in payments. So those would be sort of online payments, wire transfers, and, and so on with foreign currency. And that is a highly competitive market. So there is a risk that in that business, which I you know haven't focused on too much, uh, they could be at a competitive disadvantage. And if they use a lot of cash, in the wrong areas in an industry like that, um, that may not be very value accretive. So I think I think those would be a couple risks. Now, given the small market cap, how do you size this position in your portfolio? I mean, you obviously run a very concentrated portfolio, but how does the market cap influence position sizing for you? Yeah, I think um, market cap itself um doesn't influence too much i tend to, i mean the, obviously the trading volume is quite linked to the market cap so um you know that 
you know, that comes into consideration, you know, because of my long-term focus and, and the client base that is, you know, aligned with that, um, I don't need sort of to be able to sell out of a position on a sort of daily or weekly basis. Um, so that does allow me to invest in things that are a bit more illiquid. So um, this is a large position for me um, and I haven't sort of limited it because of the liquidity. Um, I think, uh, you know, one important thing that I focus on on position sizing is downside risk. And that's probably the biggest factor in helping me determine position sizes. And, you know, just because of um, sort of the previous answer where I, I think I'm quite comfortable with the downside here, that's enabled me to size it as a larger position. Yeah. Is there any sell side coverage on this name? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Got it. Love it. Um, let's talk about Kindrel. Uh, yeah. The other name you mentioned on the call. Yeah. So Kindrel, um, uh, I should mention it, uh, came second in the uh, Sum Zero uh, annual challenge in its category. So, uh, you know, definitely thankful to those who who voted for that. Um, a different type of business. So the ticker is KD. Um, it's a spin-off from IBM that is successfully turning itself around. Uh, the market cap is much larger at five billion dollars, uh, sixteen billion in revenues, and trades at twenty-one dollars per share. Um, and the free cash flow was negative for this business at the spin-off in late twenty twenty-one. I think it's about a dollar fifty per share today in free cash flow, and about four dollars in three four years time. Um, so I do think the stock can be worth forty dollars or more at that point, uh, which, which does give significant upside and. Uh, this is another value uh, business. The company is the largest provider of services to manage on-premise data centers. So a fairly boring market that is declining at sort of low to mid single digit rates per annum. Uh, IBM offloaded Kindrel because they wanted to rebrand themselves as a kind of growing business. Um, and the stock initially was priced at 50, but IBM had to sort of settle for 28. Um, it sold down to $8 uh, because each Kindle share was worth one twentieth of an IBM share. Um, so uh, although it's actually risen significantly since then, I actually think the risk reward is better today. Um, and, you know, Kindle seems like a very unattractive business, but there are actually several clues that suggests it could turn itself around. Um, I think one important clue is that the CEO, Martin Schroeter, worked his entire career at IBM and was retired uh, and came out of retirement to take this job. Um, he knows the business really well, and he owns about two and a half million in shares and options, you know, vesting or exercising between sort of 18 and $39. So I think he would only have come out of retirement if he thought those targets were very much beatable. Um, and he and other members of management have also bought, bought a significant amount of stock. So that's what really attracted me to it initially. Um, and there are some easy wins for Kindrel now. So I think the biggest one is that 40%, so four zero of uh, its contracts at the spin earned uh, no gross margin. And that's because IBM would often bundle these in with other services to fuel growth in other areas. Um, and essentially, if the company it succeeds in bringing that gross margin up to 20%, uh, like the rest of its contracts, there's a quite straightforward path to $4 a share in free cash flow. And uh, Kindrel is succeeding in doing that. So gross margins have increased from 12% at a group level now to 19% in its most recent quarter, just sort of reported last week. And I think just as importantly, signings in the last several quarters have been at 26% gross margin. And because of the nature of this business with three to five year contracts, it just takes time for old contracts to roll off and new ones to begin. And so there's a clear path, I think, to get to that 26% gross margin and then that free cash flow. Um, and I think that there's a few other easy wins also. The company can now grow businesses that compete with IBM. So consulting, for example, is now 15% of revenues and growing at double digit rates. Um, and then helping clients move to hyperscalers such as AWS or Azure is something the company could not do at IBM. But 
uh, I think that business can now grow to about 10% of revenues. So management do expect the company to return to revenue growth in 2025 as these businesses start to become a bigger part of the mix. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that Kindle is gaining market share from its two largest competitors. Uh, that would be DXC, whose CEO resigned late last year, and also Atos, which is a company in Europe that's sort of struggling to raise capital and, and survive right now. And probably the last opportunity they have is that I, I think most people know that IBM tends to have a fairly high cost structure. And this is an area that Kindrel has been taking some steps to address. If you look on a revenue per employee basis, uh, Kindrel's is much higher than its competitors, which suggests that due to the kind of mission critical and sticky nature of its work, uh, it might be a better business that could be more profitable if it can manage cost. Um, so I, yeah, just to summarize, I think Kindrel has a fairly clear path to $4 in free cash flow. And, you know, a 10 times multiple would put it on $40. Um, I think you get some dividends and, and buybacks along the way also. Um, and if the company does get to growth, you can probably look at a higher multiple than that 10 times. How would you, um, how would you rate the competitive sort of advantages or is there any sort of moat to the business? I think that um, the main moat is just how sticky uh, these contracts are. So just to maybe give a bit more sort of specific example, about half their clients are large financial institutions. So these would be databases of you know the major banks in in the U.S. You know managing very important and sensitive data. That is not something where a major bank is just going to kind of change providers easily. So it, it's very very uh, kind of mission critical and sticky. Um, anyone that uses an IBM uh, mainframe uh, typically prefers Kindle just because of its nature of being part of IBM in the past. Um, but I think it's, yeah, just the nature of these contracts uh, makes it a very kind of resilient business. And you've an interesting thing is you've seen that in the last two or three quarters where IT spend generally has been down. And if you look at DXC and Atos, these businesses are down sort of 10% per annum uh, in revenues terms, but Kindrel has really been sort of flat, um, you know, down low single digits. So I think that kind of illustrates that there is quite a big uh, difference in, in their work. You know, how do you differentiate uh, the value traps from these opportunities you're finding where the multiple is low you know, what, what's your kind of thinking around just avoiding value traps, given that you're yeah. in this, you know, world where, where, where the optics, you know, things look cheap, but, you know, maybe yes. they're always. Going to be. I, I think that's, you know, the, the key question. And I think, um, you know, there's probably two ways. Um, one sort of more generally, I think is really important, particularly in the small caps and, and also particularly internationally, that you have a management team that is highly aligned and incentivized because there are, as you say, a lot of cheap companies where maybe there is a, an owner operator who owns over half the company, or maybe it's a family business. And, you know, maybe they're not actually that focused on generating shareholder value. So I think, you know, the first thing is you, you really need that alignment, I think is really important. And um, in the case of both CXI and Kindrel, actually, that that's something that really attracted me. And then I think in the case of Kindrel, the reason I say I think it's actually a better risk reward today than when it, even though the stock has, has sort of doubled since the bottoms, uh, is just the downside. I think when the company spun out, it was a loss-making business in an industry that is declining. And that can be very dangerous if the company doesn't turn itself around. And you know, turnarounds are difficult. And so today, where it is generating free cash flow, you can see with the order book uh, what things are going to look like in a few years. I think that's been really in, important in making sure that this is not a value trap. Um, uh, in terms of catalysts, are, are there any in particular? Or you just watch out for I, earnings or what, what, what kind of the latest? Yeah, on, I on think catalyst? with this company, there is there probably is not a hard catalyst. The stock has tended to sort of 
grind upwards with every earnings and people can see margins go up and, and profitability improve. I think um, that will probably continue. Um, you know, two two things that could become catalysts over the next 18 months or so, I think management have talked repeatedly about revenue growth in 2025. And I think mm -hmm. psychologically, that's quite important for investors for it to be a low single digit grower rather than a low single digit, you know, declining business. So I think that will be quite a big moment uh, when that happens. Yeah. The, it sounds like the thesis is predicated on cost cutting and cost control as this sort of low hanging fruit, not yes. so much whether it grows or not. You, you sort of see it as a steady business where they, they cut costs. I think that's right. And I don't think it is necessary for them to achieve growth to for the stock to work from here because they can get to that four dollars in free cash flow with these straightforward measures. But I do think that if you want additional upside, uh, you know, for it not to be valued at 10 times free cash flow, but but something higher than that, I do think you need a little bit of growth um, to achieve that. But the, the good news is, you know, that would be additional uh, upside from here. Now, g given the market cap, this this stock will have some sell side coverage. I, yeah. What is the sell side telegraphing in terms of uh, where the upside is? Are they are they kind of on the same page with respect to not expecting growth, but rather just expecting cost cutting, or are they telling a different story from the one you're telling? I think the story is a little bit different on the sell side. There are five sell side analysts covering this company, and. I think the story is a little bit less focused on that cost cutting and um, margin expansion. I think that that's a part of it. But, you know, as you've uh, noticed, I think for this thesis to work, you don't actually need a lot of growth. I think for the sell side, they are more focused on just getting uh, some level of growth from the company, which is why I think it's sort of psychologically important. I do think on the cost side, if you look at the various initiatives management set out at the spin, They've actually completed nearly all the um, sort of cost targets they set out and they've completed that early. But there's no reason why that needs to stop once they've achieved their targets. You know, I, I fully expect they will continue to, you know, improve their contracts and uh, focused on costs. So I think uh, some, you know, people on the sell side, you know, maybe aren't looking beyond uh, these targets and, and seeing kind of more margin expansion potential. How long do you typically hold positions in your fund? Is it typically multi-year or what's the typical time frame? Yes, it's definitely multi-year. I mean, uh, initially I look for a three to five year uh, period. Um, so currently the fund is just coming up on its four year anniversary and there are still positions we hold that uh, we had at inception um, and, and that I would expect to hold for the foreseeable future. So it can definitely be be long term. Um, in the case of a company like Kindrel, I think it's fair to say it's less of a structural grower. So maybe it's more of a, you know, on the three-year side, we get the margin improvement and that gets reflected. And then we sort of reevaluate at that point whether it's really able to achieve that uh, growth. Chris, this is great. Um, love the conviction and, uh, you know, want to wish you the best on, on your fund and, and the strategy um, would love to hear more of your picks over time. Um, they all seem, you know, simple and clear, which is always the best uh, <laughs> when it comes to stocks. So thanks for joining us. And, um, you know, again, looking forward to more of these. And we'll, we'll be watching uh, uh, Kindrel and CXI over time for sure. Great. Thanks, Davia. Thanks right. for having me on.